Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. It's a dream of a unified Africa gradually coming to the realization. Hello to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us thus day. It's another edition of the program Views and the Continent. And we're glad to have you glued to the Pan-African television, Afric Media, as we continue to talk about issues of utmost importance. Today, we want to look at a very important topic, which is a visa-free Africa. And we're asking this question, is it a catalyst for growth and transformation of uh, the continent Africa, just to inform us of that uh, the leadership of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, has become one of the latest leaders in Africa to announce a visa-free travel for Africans all over Africa. And of course, coming at a time or some weeks after his Kenyan counterpart, William Roto, announced uh, that by the start of the year 2024, Kenya is also to, uh, going to be a visa-free nation for all Africa. And uh, that is what, uh, of course, we are talking about this day. And of course, uh, this uh, debate uh, program uh, dives into this uh, compelling topic a visa free Africa. Is it a catalyst for continental growth? and transformation. It should be noted uh, that Africa has uh, been making strides, be it in the political sphere, economic sphere, and uh, you can uh, name the, re uh, the rest, especially in terms of uh, uh, economic development uh, uh, guided by its developmental agenda 2063. And of course, uh, the historic free trade agreement the uh, political elites of Africa in recent times have engaged in transformative uh, approaches uh, that could make Africa change the perspective of intra-Africa trade and equally see the continent's position it served in the, the uh, global economy. Thus, uh, during uh, this uh, informative and uh, interactive session of uh, views on the continent, we want to uh, have a discussion uh, on how to explore the, the potential benefits and equally the challenges of a visa-free Africa, looking at also the uh, right parameters that can be adopted uh, by African stakeholders to ensure uh, that this uh, visa-free Africa is uh, sustainable and of course uh, that will benefit uh, uh, the uh, whole of the African continent our stakeholders, economic political stakeholders, have been gradually involved in the uh, uh, lives or the, 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 the atmosphere or the ecosystem, especially the economic ecosystem of African states. We want to see to what extent uh, this visa-free policy will help uh, drive development, especially economic uh, transformation across the continent, Africa. Uh, while we are looking at uh, this topic, it is imperative uh, to also identify key or focal points that are of utmost importance as we continue to talk about the visa-free uh, Africa given the latest development or the latest de uh, decision taken by one of Africa's leaders Paul Kagame so we're going to look at uh, this uh, visa uh, free in the area of, uh, of it fostering uh, economic growth and social integration. Uh, secondly, we want to highlight as well concerns regarding uh, the aspect of security, economic strain, and uh, potential brain drain. And uh, in another perspective, we look at uh, Maybe representatives are uh, giving a, a, a viewpoint of every stakeholders, like advocating for a, a balanced approach that considers both the advantages and the disadvantages of a visa travel, visa free travel. And finally, among others, we want to look at how regional integration and development uh, will be uh, boosted or uplifted uh, uh, by uh, this uh, visa free uh, move. Uh, that African countries are actually uh, already uh, putting uh, into place and looking at uh, into greater insight of uh, the economic implications of this. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, your uh, presence now, but uh, I want to be doing this alone. Uh, I will now introduce to you a panel of experts to give us insight on this very compelling uh, debate program, uh, which, of course, a topic of 
interest, especially in Africa, uh, that is trying to position itself in uh, the total global transformation. I will be taking you right away uh, to Canada. Let's meet Mr. Elijah Enwako, who is joining us in his capacity as a, a researcher with Leeds University, particularly on African development. It's a pleasure having you this day, Mr. Enwako, to talk about this uh, visa-free Africa and of course to answer the question if it's actually a catalyst for growth and transformation in Africa. Hello, Mr. Elijah Inoko. I cannot hear you, please. On Unfortunately, uh, I cannot hear you still, but then uh, let's uh, also acknowledge uh, the, the presence of uh, Wally uh, Ojewali, who is an expert on uh, conflict, uh, organized crimes, and uh, security uh, governance. It's a pleasure having you this day, sir, to share your insight on this very important topic, visa-free Africa. Is it a catalyst for continental growth and transformation? Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Just to check if everything is okay with Mr. Elijah Inoku. Please, uh, uh, can we hear you, sir? Unfortunately, uh, we still have a technical issue with Mr. Inwaku. While we're trying to fix that, let's write off uh, with you, uh, uh, Mr. Wally. We're talking about the visa free Africa, asking the question if it's a catalyst for growth and uh, transformation in Africa. And of course, uh, this topic is coming at a time where one of Africa's leaders, as we already highlighted in the preamble, Paul Kagame has announced uh, that it will make, it is, uh, Rwanda will become uh, visa free uh, for Africans traveling to the country. So what is your perspective uh, regarding uh, the decision by Paul Kagame and the potential decision uh, of, uh, of uh, his uh, Kenyan counterpart, William uh, Roto, regarding the aspect of visa-free and holistically what do you think a visa-free Africa will mean for the continent are we gradually moving to the realization of a unified Africa thank you so much um, I think I will start, start on the note of the fact that uh, for Kagame and for Ruto I think the central objective of this visa-free regi uh, free regime is uh, purely economic and it is quite understandable. For instance, I think uh, Kenya should run probably second um, in Africa in terms of tourism destination. That should be after Africa, uh, South Africa. I know they've always been competing with each other because of the abundance of um, wildlife tourism that they both have in common. And Rwanda is also trying to open up for business. If the country has gone to get sponsorship with uh, international brands like uh, Asthma Football Club and then I think another big club in Germany. The, and the whole idea is to market Rwanda as a popular destination. And like Kigami said, the middle class in Africa is growing. And as that continues to grow steadily, you also know that uh, some of the areas where they probably going to spend their money is in the area of tourism. Uh, maybe going on holiday at a certain period in a year. And then um, Rwanda is trying to project itself as a popular destination for most Africans to be able to visit. And they also buy products that I consider as benefit when people visit the country. It's not only that they spend in the country, people are also exploring business opportunities. We also look at what they can tap from that country. So I think it's something that is in order, it is expected, and then they are liberalizing visa regime for um, the benefit of Africans who want to visit the country. And I think they are also providing a lesson for other Africans who are probably operating a very draconian visa regime um, for intending uh, travelers. So it's, it's a welcome development in that is going to also serve as an impetus and an, a form of encouragement to other countries to copy. So five out of 54, uh, potentially had a career on that list. I think um, 
we are making some marginal progress and then these i believe in the next two to three years is also going to encourage some other countries to follow suit so it's a welcome development at least for the economic benefits it's a welcome uh, development, especially for economic uh, benefits, uh, Mr. Wally. I will go one more time to check with Mr. Elijah in Wako if everything is okay, so we can uh, get his own perspective regarding uh, the uh, topic for discussion this day. Okay, I'll come to you subsequently, Mr. Inwaku. Uh, let's ride on uh, uh, Mr. Wally. You actually met mentioned uh, that uh, actually uh, removing uh, the visa, uh, of course, uh, making it a visa-friendly nation, uh, it's uh, for economic benefits. You and I, of course, uh, are aware of some of the constraints uh, that uh, will always uh, arise when we talk about a visa-free nation or a visa-free uh, continent, uh, especially at a time where we have security issues uh, and you as a security expert, because I, I want to let us look at it from the positive perspective because when a decision is taken like this or when you start hearing voices of we need a visa-free Africa, there are some people who are very skeptical about how sustainable this will be and of course still skeptical about the susceptibility of African borders. But from a, a, a security uh, expert's perspective, what do you think can be done to actually uh, curtail maybe solve the security problems across, especially across borders in Africa to ensure that this uh, visa-free Africa is sustainable, that will benefit the whole of the African continent. You quite mentioned tourism, and of course we cannot sideline the African continental free trade area, which has to thrive, and it, for it to thrive, there, there is need uh, for uh, flexibility, among the African countries in terms of services, in terms of personnel, and in terms of goods and services. So as a security expert, what are those uh, security uh, uh, parameters that needs to be taken into consideration to ensure that Africa gradually moves towards a visa-free nation that will boost intra-Africa trade? The starting point uh, is to underscore the fact that the idea of a modern nation state is a fairly recent one. Maybe about 100 years ago, people don't need visa to move across the border. You are in, I mean, you are in Cameroon. You know that a lot of people who are around the Damawa, Taraba, Cross River State in Nigeria, for instance, are almost the same people that you find on the other side when you get into Cameroon. So it has always been an homogeneous society clustered around certain places. And then in 1884, when they decided to bacchanize Africa, you find people who are of the same tribe and tongue I mean, finding themselves in three, four places according to European decision as at that time. So um, Africans have always been moving around. They've never really had any constraints. And then now that uh, the modern state now introduced the idea of visa regime, the, what we need to underscore is that Africans are still moving and they are moving across the border. And then we can't say because of insecurity, then we create another constraint and now make le people who want to do legitimate business to move and move swiftly. I think it was Aliko Dangote, the richest man in Africa, that made uh, a statement that uh, even as, a, as the richest man in Africa, he needs visa to visit about 30 countries, whereas some European citizens and American citizens don't need visa to enter some of the countries in Africa. So we can't be caging ourselves when people can easily move to Europe, for instance, and tour 26 countries before they return to their country just because they are holding Schengen visa. But you can't even move from it is from Nigeria to Equatorial Guinea. You it can take you forever. So these are the things that we have to I mean contend with as African. If they are sorting out our people from crossing the Mediterranean Sea to move. I mean, to get into Europe or any other places like William Ruto, president of Kenya, mentioned, we can't also shut our people in here. But what is very, very important is that visa regime is not necessarily for money making. Visa regime, the idea of visa regime, it goes hand in hand with policing your border. 
So for instance, it is not that all common affairs that you say people should come. Any country that is going to liberalize its visa regime must have strong policing presence in that to manage their, I mean, the possible fallout of this. And the case of Rwanda, Rwanda is a very small country in terms of landmass. You don't expect Cameroon to make the same decision that Rwanda has made now. You don't expect Nigeria to make such decision as well if you want to liberalize our visa regime. So the insecurity is still there. Where the major insecurity is actually taking place is people moving across informal borders, across countries. So how do you want to police those places? How many guns have they um, um, seized, for instance, in Douala or Yaoundé airport? Whereas guns are probably moving from Nigeria to Cameroon, from Cameroon to Nigeria, and these are experiences across Africa. So it is not in now putting a constraint on people who want to move legitimately across the border through former routes, this time around, whether by road, by airport, or by seaport, or any other means. That is where the challenge is. And if you want to go in this direction, I'm not advocating that countries should completely adopt the Kenyan, the Rwandan model of uh, liberalizing uh, visa regime. What I think we need to do is to borrow examples from places where they have actually tried to make things easier for intended travelers. And I'm going to cite the example of Kenya and Tanzania. For instance, you don't need to take your passport to, to any embassy if you want to go to Kenya or you go to Tanzania. You go on the internet, you fill all the forms and everything, and in three, four, five days, your passport is out. That is what it should be. Um, and that is what I actually advocate. Because you can't liberalize your visa regime if you have not uh, sorted the issue of policing. It is very, very important so that if somebody comes into your country, you know where he's coming from, you know where he's going, you know what he has come to do. We still need to document people's movements for the sake of uh, security. So I think that I believe uh, I know Rwanda to be a strong policing state. I believe they've gotten all those things right before they now made this announcement. For the case of Kenya, I can't say much, but I know that they have also liberalized their visa regime for a long time now. So what is important now is that other African countries like Nigeria, which I'm aware that it's very difficult to also get visa to Nigeria, according to what some international partners have told me, I've personally um, had very terrible experience trying to go to Equatorial Guinea. I couldn't enter. Um, just last month, I couldn't also go to Angola because of the draconian requirements to process visa. And I know that these are the experiences all over the places. One of my friends, my colleague, wanted to travel to South Africa. And then he filled the form online and they are asking for the uh, if the mother-in-law is still alive. And if it is not, if it's not, she's not alive, she should produce the death certificate. What kind of requirement is all those things? I mean, we are talking about mother-in-law now, not even his own father or mother. These are some of the draconian experiences that you see all over the places. I, for here, I'm a citizen of ECOWAS. I wanted to go to Angola here. And they are asking me uh, at the Angolan embassy for um, 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 resident permits. We are a Senegal doesn't issue that to any ECOWAS citizen. So these are some of the things that uh, I think um, some of these countries need to really understand and simplify for intended travelers. So that is where the challenge is now. Everybody cannot copy the Rwanda model if you have not done the good work that Rwanda has done at home in terms of policing. So it has to, it can't be one size fits all. That is what I'm trying to say. It has to be dealt with case by case. But what you and I need to agree upon is that we need to make the ease of movement really easy for people, particularly Africans to move across Africa. And Rwanda and Kenya, I think they are setting a good example. That's uh, dear Owoli. Coming back to you and hoping that all is good now, Mr. Elijah Enoklu. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you 10 on 10. Can you hear me? <laughs> Beautiful. I can hear you now very well, of course. Uh, now it's time to talk, of course, what is very imperative. Uh, Mr. Wally has been leading with uh, the analysis regarding our topic for discussion today, and we see that there's a lot more to talk about. Uh, the intent or the, 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 the re resume there to behind uh, this uh, visa-free Africa. And while Mr. Wally highlighted uh, that it is largely uh, economically 
highly motivated. We were looking at uh, maybe some of the constraints, but then before particularizing uh, these questions, let me get your holistic uh, approach regarding, especially the latest decision taken uh, by uh, the Rwandan leadership, Paul Kagame, making Rwanda a visa-free nation uh, for all African countries. So what's your perspective? And of course, uh, the perspective of William uh, Roto of uh, Kenya. So before I begin, Clarice, I just want to clarify and make sure that all Africans understand that this is one of the preamble of the agenda 2063 that africans should be able to move freely within africa without looking for visas so when it comes to kenya taking the lead and rwanda taking the lead i am going to guarantee you as a researcher and somebody who's looking at numbers the trend is showing who is going to go ahead in africa and who is going to be left behind. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. When you see Kenya taking the lead and doing this, and you see Rwanda taking the lead, and let me just remind our viewers that Seashells has taken a lead long ago. So it is not just Kenya and Rwanda. Seashells has taken lead when the African Union started this idea of an African passport. Seashells took the lead. There are a couple of countries in Africa where Seashells was working, but the, uh, the the downside of what Seashell was trying to do is that they were doing it on a bilateral agreement. They were going country by country in Africa and making those bilateral agreements on which country is going to be visa-free to Seashell. So a couple of countries have taken the lead on these, but they were doing it at the bilateral level. But now coming as an African, coming according to the preamble of Agenda 2063, mm -hmm. They are gigantic benefits for Africa. I understand. I listen to my colleague Wally. I agree with what he said, but there are a couple of things that will go beyond that. That it shouldn't be countries trying to to hedge their borders based on security concerns and so on. Because let me give you some numbers here. The same countries in Africa. We should understand that African countries, about thirty percent of them, allow visa free to. Canadian and American citizens. You do not need a visa to go to 30% of African countries. So if we are allowing foreigners to come to our country, uh, countries visa-free, and we do not allow our own people, if we are talking about Pan-Africanism here, let's understand, we are talking about Pan-Africanism. We do not allow our own people come in to do business, to trade, to share skills for education, and for many other things, and then it means the idea of Pan-Africanism is still on paper. Because if you go by the numbers, I'm a numbers person, I deal with numbers. Research tells us that intercontinental trade within Africa is below 10%. Intercontinental trade inside Africa itself. And there was one uh, value chain that did a research of their own industry and said, it takes close to five to six percent of their revenue to process visas for their workers to work within Africa. We are talking about a value chain that has branches in many countries in Africa, Cameroon, Kenya, Tanzania, and so on. They have branches all over there. They said 10 percent of their uh, income is spent to process visas for their workers to go and work in that same industry in different countries. Just take a bag. Take a step back and look at this and say, if we cannot allow indigenous African com uh, companies to trade within the African zone, how do we expect those countries to break out in the international scene? So that is a problem, number one. Number two, we are talking about skills, transfer of skills, for example. My friend Wola is from Nigeria. We know that Nigeria is very strong in certain aspects. I I've not really studied the economy of Nigeria that much, but I know that Nigeria has certain aspects of the economy that are very strong, that they can easily export that to the rest of Africa. But the, the, the downside of that is that, I mean, the, the, the hindrance to that is that Nigeria is not able to station, you know, 
transport that technology within Africa because everybody that is well trained in that sector in Nigeria will need a visa to every single African country before he or she can move that technology to the rest of the African countries. That is a hindrance right there. Number three, we are talking about trade, ladies and gentlemen, trade within Africa. You will agree with me that it takes the eye of a needle for an African to get a visa to go and trade with off other African na nations than for the same African to get a Schengen visa to go and trade in Europe, or even to come to North America where I am. So that is something that shouldn't be uh, uh, looked upon from a security perspective and say, if we open the borders, you know, um, war is going to come from this country or criminals are going to come from this country. We are looking at particular sectors of the economy. Absolutely. What can Nigeria uh, transport to South Africa? What can Cameroon transport to Congo? What can, so we look at skills, we're looking at trade, we're looking at education, we're looking at different sectors of the economy. It's not like we're going to open borders, everybody just move from one country to the other. You have something that you're going to bring across from one country to other, and those borders should be open for those people to go across in order to transfer either technology, skills, education, trade, whatever it is that one country has that the other lacks. That is the idea of Pan-Africanism and the Agenda 63. The other issues that he mentioned, like, you know, making sure that the police force is well trained, he is very right. He is very right. But that should not be a hindrance to opening the borders to the rest of African countries because Africa, like you already mentioned, we are brothers. You have, you know, it across nations. You have Yoruba people in Cameroon, Yoruba people in Nigeria, this all over the place. We were separated by the Europeans, and we shouldn't allow those artificial borders continue to keep us to be separated. We need to open up. And as I said from the beginning, the countries that are going to move ahead are those that are going to open their borders for the rest of the African countries that has the technological know-how, yeah. the educational know-how, transfer of skills, and trade to move faster. If you look at Rwanda and Kenya, I am telling you, these are becoming the economic breadbasket of Africa as we speak. So these are smart leaders. They know what they are doing. They understand the security risk. They understand the other challenges. But they know that opening their borders is going to outweigh some of those challenges that they are going to face. And they're going to tackle that as time goes on. So I think Africa should go in all out on this agenda and let Africa be visa-free to Africans. We can handle the rest of the challenges as time goes on. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Elijah, tackling uh, one challenge. Uh, one day at a time, uh, like uh, uh, just to, to uh, uh, confirm uh, with what you're saying, uh, the uh, preamble of the uh, Agenda 2063, uh, we cannot talk of a, uh, maybe a right, a transformative journey for Africa without looking at how we can actually unify the African continent. I will stay with you. You quite made mention about very critical things and which are of utmost importance. But then uh, let, let's analyze uh, this. You talk about uh, maybe uh, the visa-free Africa. And uh, looking at a uh, visa-free Africa, it means uh, that it will boost intra-Africa trade. And we, ha we also know that there is another problem of when, when it comes to Africa trading within itself, we want to look at the aspect of uh, home uh, industries, how Africans can diversify their economies, and the substitution of imports. So uh, these are some of uh, the uh, maybe uh, points to actually look at critically while looking at how uh, a visa-free uh, Africa will entail uh, that African stakeholders work on this aspect. Uh, Mr. Wally already highlighted the uh, security aspect, but then uh, where uh, does Africa stand on the aspect of import uh, substitution, uh, diversification of the economy, and of course, uh, seeing that Africa has what it takes to trade within itself, so not to maybe uh, uh, useless this opportunity of a visa-free continent, which we are actually advocating for. The question is fair to me, right? Absolutely, Mr. Elijah Enoch. Okay, okay. So 
I'm going to be a little bit specific here so that we, you know, put the nail where it actually belongs. Mm -hmm. If you look at every sector of the economy of Africa, Africa has what it takes to trade itself. If, if Africa was isolated itself from the rest of the world, whether you're talking about the United States, you're talking about European Union, you talk about China, let's take a hypothetical situation where say, every continent deal with itself with the, ex for the, with the exclusion of all others. Africa has every single thing it can to trade with itself to the exclusion of the rest of the world. I can guarantee you that. Because every African country has specific sectors that develop that they will transfer that to those countries that have not been developed in that area. If you take agriculture, for example, take Nigeria. The Benue Strait is the economic breadbasket of Nigeria. If you take agriculture within the Benue uh, uh, sub basin alone, and you say, let Nigeria transfer that technology, if at all they have developed it so well, to the rest of ECOWAS. You take cocoa, for example. You take Cote d'Ivoire, for example. You said, let Africa trade with itself and let Cote d'Ivoire be able to transport cocoa into chocolate without transporting it or without selling it to the European Union or North America. You have the technology within the African region that they will be able to buy every single cocoa that is produced in Ghana, in Cameroon, in Cote d'Ivoire, transport it, sell it within the African region to the exclusion of the rest of the world, and they will still be able to survive. You take skills, for example, let's say IT. We know that South Africa, for example, is well advanced in information technology. If we say we exclude the rest of the world and let Africa alone just trade with South, we go to South Africa and say, hey, Mr. South Africa, can you export the technology that you have to the rest of the African continent? You export it to Nigeria, you export it to Cameroon, you export it to the rest of the world, I mean, the rest of African countries, to the exclusion of the other continent. Africa will still survive and excel. You take, for example, um, um, uh, industrialization. We go to Egypt and Morocco and say, hey, Mr. Egypt, Mr. Morocco, in terms of industrialization, you are well advanced more than the rest of the African country. Can you export what you have to, to sub-Saharan Africa, like Cameroon and rest of other countries in sub-Saharan Africa, to the exclusion of the world? I am telling you, Africa is still going to survive. You can pick one industry after the other in terms of trading with itself. Africa will still survive without the rest of the world. But the problem, as we say, is Africa does not trade with itself. If you take South Africa, for example, take the volume of trade of South Africa with European Union or North America, it's way up there compared to the rest of African countries. If you take the volume of trade between Nigeria and France or European Union, it's way up there compared to the rest of African countries. Pick any African country. We are not trading with ourselves. We are not harnessing the potentials that we have with ourselves. That is why Nigeria will be exporting or importing matches. Cameroon will be importing matches. Can you imagine? Strike match that you use to light fire. We'll be exporting. I, you can live the common, most common thing that can be ex, you know, bought from one African country. We are exporting and importing, I mean, importing it from the Western world. If we were trading with ourselves, as I said, these are areas that we're going to exploit. We're going to exploit the strength of one country and use it to strengthen the weak ones, while weaker ones are developing whatever area or whatever sector of the economy that is weak to in order to support the other ones. So it's a thing of uh, supporting the weak using the strength, while the weak are also providing either the manpower or the resources in order to beef off the weaker areas of the rest. So Africa has everything it needs to trade with itself, whether it's the weak sector or the strong sector, even to the exclusion. I don't want to go into, you know, the African tr free trade area, because that's another area by itself, that if Africa should now, after doing all this, say the rest of the world are going to, uh, you know, trade with Africa as a block, Imagine that gigantic 1.4 billion people economy, up to $3 trillion economy, 
that they are going to trade with the rest of the world. There's going to be no competition. If we even go to the financial sector, financial sector where the trade in Africa is going to be backed by the natural resources and the gold reserve that we have in Africa, yeah. I'm telling you that there is no continent that will be able to compete. The European Union and the rest of the world, they know this, Clarice. They know this because at the launch of the African Free Trade Zone, you could see the commotion that was happening in the world. Everybody was asking the question, Absolutely, what does this yeah. mean for our bilateral trade? What does this mean by the trade that we have signed with Tanzania, yeah. Nigeria, Kenya? This, they were all children all over the world because they did not know what it means. That's to say, they know what it means. They are just holding their hands. Yeah. Africa, we are the one to exploit it and make sure that we are not taking advantage of our ignorance of what we know and we do not use by the other people. So it is on us. And this visa liberalization is just one aspect of it. We should take it with both hands and encourage the rest of African countries to follow the example of Kenya and Rwanda and Seychelles. And we'll be on the right path. Absolutely, uh, it's a gradual uh, journey uh, toward uh, taking Africa to the top, uh, uh, Somosia, of course, which is very uh, uh, visible that Africa is actually the investment hub. Uh, but then uh, Africa needs to be favorable and welcoming to Africans before we can actually see how we can boost uh, this uh, uh, direct foreign investment. Uh, uh, coming to you, Mr. Wally, uh, uh, maybe in line with what uh, Mr. Elijah and Rocco just highlighted, during the launch of the African Continental Free Trade Area, there was actually, a, 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 I don't know how to put it, but some sort of like a wind of change, a positive wind of change uh, that was uh, blowing across the economic sphere in Africa. And uh, some people were of the opinion that, that it was going and it had the potential to actually position Africa's uh, uh, in uh, the uh, global economy because even till today, we, we cannot compare Africa's voice at, at the global economic level. So these are some of the strides uh, that can make Africa to have a voice that will be heard, especially when taking some very uh, uh, big uh, economic uh, decisions. So the, the question which I've always asked and which I will relate uh, to what we're having now with the, the launch of the African free trade area, we know, it was uh, a very historic and had the potential to transform Africa in entirety. So now we look at, at the security challenges that came uh, to Africa, especially uh, in the, the, the Sahara region and other areas, uh, problems affecting uh, regional blocks and everything, especially with the launch of the continental free trade area. I want us to be very logical and look at how things unfolded. So now we want to analyze, do you think there is a, that uh, third party that isn't really happy seeing uh, that this uh, historic continental free trade area materializes? And that's why we see more and more the proliferation of uh, maybe arms in Africa and also looking at uh, the security challenges that Africa has faced since the launch of the continental free trade area. And if you think that uh, this is a, a, a classified or a defined uh, process to derail this economic move or stride by the African continent, what do you think, especially now with uh, the, the visa-free uh, regime that some countries are already implementing can be uh, the right solution towards tackling uh, all of these uh, constraints surrounding uh, around uh, the, the, the African continent, maybe uh, trying to retard uh, the steady growth of this inter, uh, intra-Africa trade? Well, the very nature of trade itself in the global sense of it is um, contestation. That is the reason why you hear terms by, I mean, by expert like uh, trade war between maybe two superpowers or certain countries. So um, uh, I think that is expected in the global scheme of things. But I would say that the challenge of integration in Africa, it is because of sheer lack of ideas, innovation on the part of the political leaders on the continent. There is really nothing holding us back in terms of external factors. For instance, if you pick Nigeria, the largest country on the continent, you are talking about, about 200 million people. That is a huge market by itself. So, for instance, 
um, uh, at the risk of sounding immodest. Nigeria does not necessarily need maybe any country in West Africa to say, I mean, for trade. I'm, and I'm, I'm being careful with this. I'm just using this as an example. This is a very large market. If you also extend that to Africa as a continent, you're talking about a continent of about 1.4 billion people. That is a huge market on its own. So I'm saying this to underscore the fact that uh, we already have potential to generate growth internally without necessarily looking to anybody, uh, maybe for what our political leaders call foreign direct investment. So what you need is to stimulate your own economic growth and then use that to now drive um, whatever you need, maybe in the area of innovation, technology, employment, and everything. You have the population here for employ I mean, for, for human resource to drive such economic growth. You have the resources here, the gold, the diamond, arable land for agriculture. We have the Congo base and um, the Congo River just pouring into the Atlantic Ocean. You have the River Niger just pouring into the Atlantic Ocean. These are resources that naturally a lot of European countries are looking for that they don't have as we have in abundance. So we have what it takes in that regard. And then the issue that you mentioned about security, you can't, uh, we can't continue to hold ourselves back because we think if we open the border, then security is going to be a major challenge. There are enough wisdom and of innovation technology to deal with security by itself. You can use technology to police your border. But the people that are also taken to crime, you have to know that it is the internal contradictions in those countries in terms of still inequality and unemployment that is actually making people, it's part of the factor that is driving people to crime. So if you sort your internal contradictions of unemployment, that means you have um, the, the armed group, we have lesser pool to recruit from to probably drive their criminal tendencies. But the issue about insecurity generally, I must hang on the fact that there is no country in the world that is secure. The gun epidemics in America, there's no any African country that can measure up to that. I mean, you you hear a lot of, a lot of seemingly disturbing news, like um, some people just go on the street, they go into the mall and they are shooting people. So what happens here is just that our own crime is taking place in the rural area, in places where they consider to be ungoverned spaces. But even the whole mighty American, with all the superstructure of, I mean, of uh, security architecture, look at the gun epidemics. So it doesn't mean that uh, there is one country that is safe of crime. Look, war, I mean, the Middle East has remained in a perpetual state of uh, instability. I mean, uh, of security challenges. Let me put it that way. But when it comes to religious tourism in the world, this same zone, no any other continent, I mean, no any other region rivals in uh, the, I mean, the tourist attraction that they generate annually in terms of people going for holy pilgrimage in Israel. I mean, even with the war that is going on between Israel and Hamas now, I'm not sure that people are not still going to travel to Jerusalem for pilgrimage. The same thing with people who travel to, 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 for Hajj, to Mecca, to Jeddah, and all these places. So what I'm trying to underscore is the fact that even though we have our security complications and challenges, there are no things that cannot be surmounted. It is just that the leaders have lacked the courage, they've lacked the ideas, they've lacked the innovation to address the issues. And then they resort to primordial issues like uh, don't let people move into our country. I was having a meeting with some senior government officials in Point Noir. And then when I was in Brasavi, I realized that you need just about five minutes on the water to cross from Kinshasa to Brasavi. So I asked, I said, why is there, why is there not a bridge connecting these two cities? Those senior officials, they laugh for more than four minutes because they, they, I think they find my question to be quite primitive. And then they asked that, uh, do you want the people in Kinshasa to come and overrun us here? They are more than us. That is the kind of primordial response that you get from senior officials who are taking critical public policy decisions, driving some of these countries. So most of these regimes feels like if you keep our people in, if we keep uh, people away from coming into our countries, then we are going to be free of crime. Now tell me which country is free of crime in Africa, even when we hedge ourselves in. So we can't, uh, we can't, because it's going to be a perpetual flux. It's not something that maybe you can end in a day. 
what you need to do is to solidify your security response, your security architecture, to be able to address these issues. And then you allow trade, free flow of movement, free flow of good, free flow of ideas and innovation to thrive. And what pollinates these ideas is as people move from one place to the other, they see opportunities and then they keep coming back, they come to invest, they see your countries as popular investment destination where they know that their investment is going to be secured and guaranteed. And then you open up the space. Ideas that power civilization have been battered as a result of interaction of people. And that is the reason why globalization is not a recent event. People have been moving for more than 2,000 years. And as they move, they live in their tree. Innovations and idea. That is how we have the algebra. That is how we have mathematics. That is how we have science. And at the time that we are now living that the democratization of information technology has actually opened up the space for everybody. You can no longer hedge people in. You can no longer hedge people out because of one visa requirement, draconian visa requirement. So I think these countries are providing leadership in that regard. And other countries like Nigeria, Ethiopia, South Africa, they need to seek, I mean, take take dressing by hustle. I, I, I'm not saying everybody should make it an all comma affairs, but make it very simple for people. As simple as people being able to apply for visa on their phone. And in three, four, five days, they get the decision whether they will be allowed to come to the country or not. It's as simple as that. You can't make people to go and be keen in the embassy and they are not even sure whether they are going to get it. Um, I know anybody that travel can share different experiences about how Achillean it has been moving across Africa. This is untenable. It is unfashionable in the 21st century. And then we have experiences to copy from European Union. Let us learn the right lesson and also apply it there. Crime and insecurity are not going very soon. What we need is innovative ideas to address those security concerns and then open up the space for people to move from Kenya to Mauritania, move from Cairo to, to Cape Town. And then in three, I mean, in three decades, you will see that the whole place is going to be blown up. I mean, for prosperity for her. Just to remind those of you tuning in uh, that this is Views on the Continent on uh, African Media. And today we are looking at the visa free year Africa asking the question of uh, whether it is a catalyst for continental growth and uh, transformation. In the 21st century, a lot has happened not only in Africa, but across uh, the global world. Uh, Mr. Elijah Inoku, I will want to uh, see you uh, answer this question, which I forwarded to uh, actually to Wally, and he was very categorical, like there is nobody that can uh, stop a nation from uh, growing but then uh, I, I want to, do you share the same perspective we know whatever thing that is happening i, I i've come to realize that it's difficult to dissociate uh, uh, politics from the economy from social life and whatsoever so do you really think that uh, africa is void of these uh, what i can call uh, uh, economic terrorism or do you think africa is free from geopolitical man uh, manoeuvre that is actually sinking the economy of african states and derailing uh, the uh, intra africa trade what's your perspective on this I will say categorically, no, Africa is not free, Clarice. And I will give you concrete examples. Mm -hmm. Africa is not free from this maneuver, geopolitical maneuver from the West. But the thing is, I always say this and I will say it again. If you are having a problem in your house with your husband or with your wife, and you do not allow outsiders to come in and intervene, you can solve that problem. But if you allow outsiders to come in, they're going to solve it according to their own solution, whatever it is, to their benefit. Absolutely. That is what we are having in Africa. The truth is, there is geopolitical maneuvering going on in Africa. Whether you're talking about conflicts, people who are benefiting. If you look at the problems that are going on in Eastern Republic of Congo, where you have the M23, you have the Woji Woji, you have more than 23 rebel groups that are fighting. That zone alone, as we speak, carries more than, I would say, between 25 to 30% of the world reserves instead of mineral resources. I'm talking about metals, metals. 
when you talk about uh, cobalt, all these new metals that are going to be used in technology and food, that Eastern Republic of Congo itself carries a huge potential of those resources and gold. So you f find international, what we call blood money. You have Belgium's organizations, I mean, uh, Belgian companies that are secretly signing deals with rebel leaders. They know that in an Africa where you have free trade, in an Africa where you have peace, in an Africa where you have people being in charge of their resources, these people will not be able to do what they are doing in that Eastern Republic of Congo. Take Sudan, as you're speaking. The United Arab Emirates, together with the United States, are playing cat and dog between Hamidi and 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 and, and, the, and the and the other rebel uh, general. Mm -hmm. They are playing hard and dog because they know if you go to Darfur, where the gold mines are, where Hamidi came from, that is where the crux of the matter is. These people, I, I, I'm not going to hide away from telling you that yes, there is maneuver that is going on in Africa. This maneuver that's going on in Africa. If you talk about France, before they were being kicked away from the Sahel, they knew what they were milking from that region. That's why they don't want anything to happen in that region. So we, as Africans, that is to answer your question in total, we as Africans are the ones allowing these people to come in there, destabilize us, carry away our resources, do all these things, and then we are left with peanuts. And we begin to fight ourselves, and we believe that. You know, if we go to France, if we go to North America, like where I am, that's where we are better off. I did not even need to be here. I did not. And say the same thing with the rest of Africa that are out here. They don't even need to be here. If we had what it takes in Africa, a continental free trade area, if we have a visa free, if we have the economy of Africans that are being controlled by Africans, as we speak, Clarice, the Kenyan president, in the name of Dr. William Ruto, suggested a peace path for the problem in Sudan. Hamiti, one of the rebel leaders, rejected that peace path in favor of an American sponsored and uh, 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 UAE sponsored agreement. We are rejecting African solutions to African problems in favor of some Western solutions to African problems. This is where we find ourselves. And it's the same thing what we are talking about here. The African liberalization of the economies of Africa so that Africans can move freely within Africa. If we talk about insecurity that my colleague talked about, where don't you find insecurity? The Biafra problem in Nigeria has spilled over to Cameroon. The Amazonia problem in Cameroon will be spilling over to Nigeria. The problem in Central African Republic is spilling over to Cameroon. The problem in Chad is spilling over. The problem in the Sahel region in Burkina Faso is spilling over to Niger. The problem in Mali is spilling over to... So there is nothing like one African country trying to isolate itself and say, oh, no, I don't want to open my economy because my neighbor has this. We all have problems in Africa. And the problem should be solved as an African problem. The problem should be solved like the way, let me give you an example of the way the European Union came about the European Union. They came out with the preamble just like we have Africa 2063, and they put conditions in place and say, before you join the European Union, you have to make sure that your economy is brought to this level. You have to make sure that the corruption in your country is brought to this level. You have to make sure that it, they give conditions, and every country was working towards that condition. And before every country joined, they made sure that they were examined at the European Commission, that they have met those conditions. If the African Union is working towards something like this, they can put strategies in place, like my colleague said, technology in place to monitor the institution. You know, come together and say, if you want to be part of this, you know, free trade, the free that we are all opening up, put your house in order, Mr. Mayor. If you don't put your house in order, you're not going to join this. People are going to work towards that common goal. So Absolutely. this idea of leaving Western Union, I mean, Western countries come in there and exploit us and make us as if we are not able to manage our own economy or we are not able to liberalize our own economy and free with one another. It's a ploy. And I'll say, answer your question, yes, 100%. There's geopolitical maneuvering happening in Africa, but we are allowing ourselves to be manipulated. As long as we stand our ground and we know what we want, it will not happen, Clarice.
Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think I should come back to you, Mr. Wally. Uh, and uh, the question uh, which I'll be directing to you this time around, it's we're talking about visa-free. Uh, just a handful of African countries have taken this decision, and we are hoping that other African countries uh, will do the same uh, be be because we want to see a unified Africa. Africa should be unified at every uh, uh, front. So the, the question is, uh, uh, according to you, Mr. Wally, what are the uh, practical steps that should be taken by African countries uh, to ensure uh, that uh, uh, the sustainability of, of visa-free travel across Africa, especially in the 21st century, and you know that as uh, the world is evolving a lot and people are evolving, and that's how Africa multilateralism is increasing in Africa. And of course, a visa free travel for Africans, I think it's another uh, advantage or another way Africans can leverage on th this aspect of multilateralism to its own advantage. So, as, as per you, what are those uh, practical steps to be taken, dear uh, Wally, to ensure the sustainability? of the visa-free travel for Africans to benefit, first of all, the African continent. Well, I will start on the note of uh, saying we have the, the facility to do that already. Um, okay. We do not need to look in any direction apart from countries that have tested this. And I'm going to continue to cite the example of Tanzania and Kenya in particular. Mm -hmm. What William Ruto is saying now, they are just taking it to the next level. So don't let other countries also jump and just open their border. Just practice what Kenya and Tanzania have done over time. I wanted to travel to Kenya, and I know somebody at the embassy. And I called them here that, oh, I want to. He said, no, 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 just go to the internet. Everything is there. And that is. People get it in two days. What happened to other countries who have not even liberalized the visa application through the internet system? So that is the starting point. It's not that everybody just come, enter. It is not. That is not what we are advocating. So to sustain this conversation, to sustain the implementation, other African countries should take the first step. Let them, let them digitize the visa application process that whether you are in your house or your phone, you don't need to go to any embassy. And let that be foolproof, secure, that is not susceptible to any, any form of security breach. Once you have done that, then you have taken the first step. And let the requirement be as simple as ABC. You don't have to ask for the death certificate of mother-in-law, father-in-law, like the example that I gave you when I started this. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is that uh, we also need to now <clears throat> begin to open up a space for business operations across countries. Let people be able to move in freely. People who have legitimate businesses to do in those countries. Then if you have been able to do this, um, I, I, I think uh, we will have been able to do 50% of the work. If it has worked in other places, I don't think see any reason why it cannot work here. And to make this thing sustainable like you have, let this idea be scaled up to the level of African Union. These old conversation must not just be agenda 2063. It has been, I mean, we've been talking about it for uh, barely a decade or more. And before you say Jack Robinson 2063 is going to be here, what are we going to hand over to the next generation? So I think AU, this conversation should be scaled up at that level. This conversation should be scaled up at regional level. Because I think the overarching objective of what this should lead us in the, di uh, the direction that this should lead us okay. is to be able to also have a common entry and common exit point. So if somebody has traveled to West Africa, for instance, let's say Ghana, such a person should also be able to enter Nigeria, enter Benin, enter Senegal. That is what is happening in the Schengen area. And I don't believe because some countries have um, what some what took some country 200 years to arrive at. We can do copy and paste and adapt what works in those places to our own context. We don't have to also wait for 200 years before we arrive at that destination. So for to make it sustainable, let's scale it up at the regional level, at the continental level, and then borrow examples that have worked in other places and other countries that are operating a draconian visa regime. If they will not take the first mover advantage, I think they are going to be left behind.
That is just the reality. And I think that is where um, Mr. Elijah started this conversation. If you won't take the first mover advantage, you're going to be left behind. It's very simple in this globalized era. Indeed. Indeed, uh, it's very simple. And of course, uh, in the globalized era, it is uh, imperative to uh, explore the scope that you can use to your own uh, advantage. Uh, rounding off with you, Mr. Elijah Inouako, there is something uh, that is very imperative. When we talk about African problems, when we talk about the issues affecting the continent Africa, be it political, economic, or otherwise, there is one aspect which we always want to touch, the mindset. When Mr. Wally was talking about his uh, uh, exchange with some personnel there in uh, Congo Brazzaville, and uh, the response that was given to him, of course, uh, you now see how the uh, ideological war or some sort of uh, mindset uh, a, a negative mindset is actually hampering uh, the transformation of the continent Africa. So as an intellectual and somebody who is very keen on African development, what do you think we can do at the right parameters to be able to start working uh, on the mindset of of Africans, especially those at the fore, to, able, to be able to see Africa as one entity in spite of our differences, but then let's look at, at that uh, point uh, where we can meet and compromise and collaborate for the uh, benefit of the, the, the African continent in its entirety. Uh, Clarice, I will just summarize by saying this. I also spoke to somebody from the, uh, who's very close to the African Union in terms of gathering data and some of the research that we do. It, I realize one weakness with the African Union. There are no timelines. You and I have talked on this show about the uh, stopping gun blazing that failed. And when you go to dig into why it failed, there were no timelines. We've been talking about the Agenda 2026. Yeah. By now, the African Union should have put on guidelines and timelines to say every single African country, by this date, you have liberalized your visa process. By this date, you have done A, B, C. By this date, otherwise, you lose certain privileges within the African Union. You give deadlines, you give timeline, you give specification to countries because this kind of mentality, like Mr. Wallen mentioned, is because people are working in isolation. That country, this country is afraid that if we open our borders, these people are going to come here, they're going to take our jobs, like what's happening in South Africa, xenophobia. We thank God for people like Julius Malema that's opening the eyes of Africans to understand that. An African, because if you look at what's happening in South Africa, our fellow brothers in South Africa, blacks, they have no problem with the white people in South Africa. That's not their problem. They have no problem with the Indians in South Africa. They have, that's not their problem. They have no problems even with the rest of, you know, Caucasians, they have no problem. Their problem is Nigerians, Zimbabweans, Mozambique, and so on. Then that's what we call self-hate. Self-hate. You see your brother as your enemy. Instead of realizing that you are being manipulated upon for selfish interest. So the mindset needs to be changed in such a way that the African Union need to take the lead and put timeline and conditions and say, every country that has not met this guideline by this deadline, you are going to lose your privileges within the African Union. So that countries start working towards that agenda, not setting an agenda and put it on the table. And by the time we come 2063, nothing has happened. I put it very clearly to the leader that I was talking to. I said, look, if I have a chance to work with you guys, these are things I'm going to push for. In 20, by 2040, we must see concrete actions on the ground in terms of the preamble of 2063. We must see actions. And any country that has not meet those deadlines, we were talking about security, for example. You're going to give condition to country and say, look, the insecurity that's happening in your country, if you do not put that into order by this date, you're going to lose your privileges. Equals is only interested in trying to go to Niger and put sanctions on Niger and do this, but they find they don't do anything in terms of making sure that that country, you know, 
they meet some of the deadlines in the Agenda 2063. All they are doing, is, oh, there's a coup d'etat, they say, but they did not look at the internal wranglings and the problems that are in that country. So African unions must take the bull by the horns, make sure that some of those guidelines and those preambles are being upon, give every country a deadline, because like Wale said, yeah. the specific, specificities within Africa are different from country to country. But if they work with the union, work with the countries that are involved, give those guidelines her the issues that they are facing i'm sure that we'll get there i'm sure that we'll get there and this mentality of thinking that one country is trying to come to take a right from the other country when you have immigration solid immigration for example i live in this country every year canada takes in close to 500,000 people and those are the people that are bedrock of this economy, of this country. The United States, all of us know about the U.S. visa lottery program. How many people leave all over the world and go to that country? And those people are the bedrocks of those countries. So anybody that has this foolish mentality that immigrants are coming over to take a job does not know what it means by the immigrant. When you have inflow of people with high skills, technology, and so on, development is going to follow. Development is not being done by indigents of that country. There is no country by that's been developed by the indigents. It's the immigrants, the people with skills, the people that have come with something different from what you've had that develop a country. So Africans must stop, start thinking backward. And we must make sure that when you understand that there are diverse benefits of immigration. In this case, we're not immigrating. I can't really call it immigration. We are brothers. If I go to Nigeria, those are my brothers. If I go to King Congo, Kinshasa, those are my brothers. We are the same people. We were separated by, in 1884 by the colonialists. So that's a different scenario altogether. So again, let people change this mentality of thinking that visa liberalization means people are coming to take their jobs. No, they are coming to make economy stronger. They are coming to reinforce what you already have. They are bringing skills. They are bringing technology. They are bringing new knowledge that you do not have, and it's going to be the benefit of every single person. competition that will help grow the economies of our countries. I want to thank you immensely, uh, Mr. Elijah Inraku, for your insight and, of course, uh, also extend a uh, sincere thank you to you, Mr. Wally, uh, for the great insight on our topic for discussion. Uh, does the, I think uh, the African media will continue to do uh, its best to, sure, to ensure that uh, they contribute their own quota towards uh, the development and transformation of the African continent. I will appreciate uh, you all for trusting your Pan-African television and of course uh, uh, take the lead uh, and of course uh, try to see how we can explore the scope uh, that has been provided to us this day or this uh, uh, period of great innovation with uh, a lot happening across Africa and dynamics are changing so that we can take this to uh, prosper the beautiful continent which is Africa. Thank you again, gentlemen, for the great insight. Thank you. Keep watching Afri Media, you all, and uh, have a lovely moment and see you or some uh, other time. Thank you.